Good guess. Uh, yes, indeed. If you have your Bibles with you, we're at Matthew 7 again, uh, nearing the end of the Sermon on the Mount. The reading will begin at verse 15, and if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. The words are usually up on the screen. Following the uh, reading and prayer, the grade 6, 7, 8 Sunday school is dismissed to their classroom in the back. Matthew 7, verse 15 and following, these are the words of Jesus. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we've acknowledged already this morning, we are gathered here to worship you. Lord, we have much in our lives to be thankful for, including the instruction of your word. Here Jesus is laying out for us decisions we must make and paths we must follow. And I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us here would, through the help of your Holy Spirit, pay attention to these words, apply them to our lives, that we might be like the wise man who built his house on the rock, so that when the storms come, the storms of life, we may stand the test because we are built on you. I just pray that this would be true of us all, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. I am, uh, yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm grateful to be back. I'm especially grateful, well, a couple things I'm pretty grateful for. One is, is that um, it's kind of a long stretch to, to be away for, for two weeks, um, but it was a nice break, and I just appreciate my church family for giving me the opportunity to go do that with my father my brothers and um been doing it for a few years now and uh um yeah it's it's uh it's a real blessing to be able to do that with them so i appreciate that and i appreciate pastor jeremy because evidently either nothing went wrong in two weeks or pastor jeremy was handling whatever fires needed to be put out so I appreciate him for that, and all of you for not using the cell phone number that you probably all have, so (laughs) appreciate that as well. But uh, anyway, so we are going to continue on, or actually uh, conclude, the Sermon on the Mount this morning. So Pastor Jeremy decided to do one or two verses at a time. We're not monkeying with that. We're just going to No, really, they're all tied together. In fact, what's interesting about this final section is that it really starts with where Pastor Jeremy was last week when he's sharing that part of the Sermon on the Mount of, you know, we want to treat others the way we would like to be treated. And then 
it has this almost mysterious, maybe a little bit of a uh, sounding like it was uh, wisdom literature, and that's because it was, statement that Jesus reiterates and, and really kind of adjusts to their culture in that day. But it says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And that's, that's not only found here, but it's found in Hebrew, in uh, the Old Testament, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's also written not just as a part of Scripture, but as, as a, a, a part of wise sayings that were found there, and, and, uh, and even some of the Greco-Roman literature has repeated parts of this. So whether it was, um, you know, Jesus' original thought or whether he was using that to help teach an idea or a concept, the concept is simple. There are two different ways. And one of the things that you find as you go through these final verses of his Sermon on the Mount is that he's contrasting Two different choices, two different ways. False prophets, true prophets. False believers, true believers. A wise man and a foolish man. And really, those paths are ones that are choices that we have that we can make. And that's the point here, is to understand that. Now, a lot of times we get caught up in false prophets, false believers, and one of the things the church is famous for is trying to figure out who those people are and then make sure that we correct the wrong. And that isn't really where Jesus is coming from, I don't believe. There are places in Scripture where we're challenged to do that, but that's not what his point is here. His point is, is that there is going to be ultimately a consequence for whatever path you choose. That's something that is really hard for our world today, isn't it? Like they do not want to hear that there's consequences about anything, really. But quite honestly, that there's consequences that are, that are brought about by very specific uh, levels of what you do or don't do, choices that you make or don't make. And, and that's, that's hard to swallow. It's difficult. And, and I think that we should be sympathetic to that because that understanding doesn't come because we're brilliant. Okay? It doesn't, we don't get that understanding from, you know, just we've, we're well read, so therefore we understand that there's consequences and this is the way it is. No, that comes to us because God's revealed it to us. And we're blessed and privileged to be able to have him care about us that much and we and we leave that up to him how that's judici ju judiciously applied in people's lives so we're talking about this idea of there being a narrow way and a wide way and the first thing that we're looking at or we need to understand is is that um, this is a summarization of the sermon on the mount when he says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. He said that a couple times throughout this sermon, and he's reiterating it again here and summarizing it all. It's like, you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is really Jesus calling people from a false religion to his true kingdom. And when we forget that, then we get caught up in little details of the Sermon on the Mount that, that can confuse us from time to time. Like, how is it that we can just give somebody, if they take one thing from us, we're going to give them something else or give them more? How can we do that in this world that we live in? And the fact is, is we can't do it without a miraculous intervention, and that's Christ. That's the only way we're going to be able to do it. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount is illustrating, is there's a great kingdom. It's coming someday, but right now we can live as much as we possibly can by those principles and apply those principles to our lives. And that's what he desires for us, because he knows that's what's best for us. 
Ultimately, that's why God and that's why Christ is such an exclusive thing. We call it or look at it like it's exclusionary. What he looks at it like is it's imperative. It's imperative for us. It's imperative for us to apply these principles to our lives. It's imperative that we choose the one and only way because there is no other choice. There's none that will solve our problem. That problem. So this is, this is what's taking place, and Jesus is talking about this true kingdom, and one thing that he is confronting, and if we forget this, we forget or don't understand what we're talking about even in today's sermon, and that is that the Pharisees and the scribes taught a false religion. And that's something that we are challenged to fight against in our own personal lives every day, is falsely believing that if I'm good enough, God will accept me. If I do it all right, if I make all the right choices, I will please God and then he will accept me. And the fact is, he's already accepted you. Will you accept him? That's, what, that's what's really at stake here. Will you ex- accept this exclusionary approach to salvation? That there's only one path. Our world doesn't like this. They want many different paths. They want to seek their own path. They want to figure their own way out. But that literally is what religion is, and that's what Jesus is up against. He's saying, listen, you don't make your own rules. You don't abide by certain rules and then get some kind of privilege. The fact is, I have provided it for you already. Why? Why won't you just accept the free gift? It's open to every person. Why not accept that free gift? And really, when you think about it, it makes much more sense, doesn't it? So first, we're going to talk about false prophets. This is very uncomfortable for me. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. This morning, even this morning, we came in and we're having our meeting before the the service and um, we're all sitting there talking and I don't know, somebody made mention of um, something to the effect of uh, sarcasm is the language of Bible fellowship, right? Innocent old sarcasm, right? And, and the fact is, is that as the, a guy that's been around here and been listened to for over 20 years, starts to make me wonder when I hear something like that, what kind of fruit are you producing? In fact, that is the, that really is the burden of being a prophet. Like, people are going to pick up on things. People are going to emulate things. I hope you know that there's some good things and some bad things that come out of this, right? And really, I'm going to just put it back on you. It's your job to figure that out, too. It's not just mine. It's mine to exemplify it the best I can, but it's yours to make sure that you discern the better things. Pick the better things, would you? I one time said, I I made a flippant comment. It was when we were remodeling this place, and we were trying to make lots of decisions all at the same time, and I I made this comment, and I'm not trying to make an excuse for it, but I said, well, it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is for permission. I have heard that repeated so many times, and I cringe every time I hear it. I know I didn't originate with me, but, you know, I just threw it out there, and then it has that kind of impact. And that's, that's what I think he's getting at when he's talking about that fruit. How much fruit do we see? I mean, we've seen a lot of good fruit. It'd be easy to focus on the bad fruit. But how much fruit do you see by the people that you hang out with? I'm going to bring it down to that because it is up to us to identify who those prophets are. And it is up to us to identify whether we have good prophets or false prophets around us. And in this day and age, 
How important is that? I mean, when you can pull it up on YouTube, whatever your heart's desire, whatever you're thinking about, whatever question you might have, how do you know who you're getting it from? That's one of the reasons the local church is so valuable is because you have accountability and you have people that you know and you get to see their life. In the Old Testament, there are many warnings about false prophets. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign, this is Deuteronomy 13, <clears throat> and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, Let's go, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments, obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. That was the responsibility of the Israelites. In Romans 16, this is in the New Testament, verses 17 and 18, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to, do to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. What's he talking about? He's talking about those who, who build a, a religious model for how you can be saved instead of understanding the true doctrine of who Christ is and his grace and mercy that you fall upon for your salvation. For such persons do not serve the Lord Christ but their own appetites and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the naive. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to de deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. 2 Peter 2.1, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So false prophets are very much a danger out there. And when I think of all the things that I see on YouTube, for instance... Not that YouTube itself is evil. I figured out how to fix the brakes on my truck a little while back. Good stuff. When you're working on the brakes of your truck, good stuff, all right? When you're working on the theology of your heart, be careful. Be very wary. Because it slips in and it's very seductive. Now this passage of scripture talks about these false prophets and it talks about them as ravenous wolves we don't think of it that way you're watching a youtube video you hear subtle new things new ideas new concepts and you're like hmm wow that might be that might be valid that might be valid that that begins to change the way you think about other things, and that affects maybe even the relationships that you have with other people. You may go down a path or a road that leads you astray, ultimately, from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when it comes to an affront of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is where you have trouble. But we don't think of it that way. We think it's, it's just harmless. I'm just... I'm getting different perspectives. That's how we might look at it. But ravenous wolves are not to be trifled with. The illustration came to my mind. It might be a li little bit crude, but in our culture, as I've grown up anyway, maybe this is very taboo now, but, you know, we used to have dogs that fought with each other and people would bet on them. We had uh, chickens or roosters or, you know, poultry that fight against each other, and, and we would bet money on who would going to win, right? We never had wolves and sheep fight. You know why? Because the outcome is inevitable, right? I think that's why Jesus uses this language. I think he's like, it's ravenous wolves. Don't mess with it. It's not your problem. In fact, that's 
what the, the passage says, right? It, it's interesting that this chapter starts with Jesus warning us not to judge lest we be judged in the same manner. Now, this doesn't mean that we're not called to judge who's a true prophet and who's a false prophet because it clearly makes that known throughout Scripture and here. That it is our job to be able to discern this, but that is what our job is. There's certain churches that I've grown up with, with and around and, and have known others, many others, that have made it their job to emphasize identifying and confronting false teachers. They've, they've pushed it so far as to say, it's your job and it's your duty as a Christian to do this. Do you remember my illustration about wolves getting in with sheep? Like, it's no contest. Why are we monkeying with these things? Why is this our job? In fact, that's not what the passage here says. What, is, what does Jesus say about it? Well, he says, these false prophets, it says in two verses, verse 16, you will recognize them by their fruits. And in verse 20, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Fruits. In verse 19, it says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, who do you think's doing that? God. That's his job. That's his job. Our job is to avoid them, to stay away from them, to reject what they teach, and to know the difference. And we need to make sure we stick to what we're doing. Because it is not a pretty picture when a lone sheep comes across the wolf. Another reason that we gather together as a body of believers is so that we have that accountability, so that there's confrontation and it's confronted in groups, so that we find ourselves consistently and regularly under the teaching of the shepherd. And I, I wasn't pointing at me. He is the leader of this church. Because we don't want to be in a confrontation with a ravenous wolf all by ourselves. Recognition is our role. That's our purpose. That's what we're here for. Most of us are looking at their works. You'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? That's a weird statement, right? Like, why does he say that? I heard one commentator say, well, sometimes fruit might get stuck to a thorn bush, and you might confuse it from afar. I, I thought, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard of. I mean, it could be, I don't know, but the chances of that happening and Jesus using it as an illustration that we remember, I, I just don't see it. But one thing I do see is I see that we have a problem, and that is that as human beings, we look at what people do and not who people are. Good example of that, you can't go without it. I mean, it was just the U.S. election. We must say something at some point. Must acknowledge those people to the South and their incredible ability to make ads. I don't know if you've ever, I, I was away for two weeks before the election, right, or a week and a half. I'm in the States, and I'm watching ad after, ad. It's, it's like, how can you keep saying the same thing over and over and over? Do you think eventually somebody's going to go, bing, oh, wow, you're, you're my person now. It's crazy. The amount of money wasted on that is, is unbelievable. But anyway, I digress. You know, one of the things that becomes apparent to you when you look at their election is, is you have two terrible choices to make. You've got somebody with what I would say has uh, good values and poor character, and you've got somebody who I don't really know. They might have good character, but they have poor values, and that's really what you're up against. It's very difficult. We need to understand is, is that it's our penchant to look at per, the things that people do. We, 
we look at each other, we look at Christians, we look at church, right? And we're like, oh, that person, they serve here and they do this and they're on the worship team and they're, they're, they're amazing, right? They're just amazing. They, there can't be anything false about them. What is their character? Who are they? What do they demonstrate in their heart? Are they a little too sarcastic? <laughs> so you'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? Are they thorn bushes? Are they figs? Or are they actually fruit trees? We don't really always know from the outside. But you can see eventually if you spend enough time with somebody, the character of the person. What is their heart? Do they, do they desire to treat others like they would like to be treated? Or in a better way of saying it, not a better way of saying it, but a different way of saying it, do they love their neighbor as themselves? And then leave the confrontation to the church, which I've already mentioned. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's, that's for a bigger group than just you. You're not the single crusader on that. And that, and that leads to better relationships in the church, doesn't it? Because we don't, aren't always good at figuring out these things either. It's just best to stay away. When you're concerned. False followers. That's the second thing that we see contrasted. The, the true followers contrasted with the false followers. In Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So here's the thing. Counterfeit followers of Jesus can be identified by two traits. One are empty words. The other are dead works. Empty words and dead works. Those are the two things that are mentioned there. Did I say Lord, Lord? I... Um, have known a, a group of Christians one time. Um, unfortunately, I personally knew people that kind of got caught up in this group. And, and one of the things that was one of their big tenets, which I thought kind of weird hill to die on, but, but is that if you don't pray in the name of the Lord, it's not real. Like that's, that's, that, that, that prayer doesn't go out to God. And uh, yes, it was confusing to me as well, but what's more confusing is to sit in a group of people that believe that, that took that position, and sit there and listen to them pray. I mean, it's like they were so afraid of not using the name Lord, it was like, I don't even, I can't quite figure out your line of thinking as you're praying. Not that it's my job, I, God knows, right? But it was very awkward and very odd. And then when you prayed with them, like, you know, do you, do you throw in a few extra lords? That was, that was what was going on in my mind. I also knew somebody that came to me and after a baptism, and we'd had this great baptism one time, and they're like, you know, you didn't, you didn't do the baptism in the name of Yahweh. Or no, Yeshua, sorry, Yeshua. And I'm like, no, but I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I mean, I don't, how, how was I supposed to say it? I didn't, use, I didn't use the right terminology. And so therefore, this person isn't really baptized. That was the inference. Those are empty words. They're just words. What is in the heart? That's what God looks upon. The Bible tells us clearly that. He looks upon the heart. And so we shouldn't trust in our words, should we? 
You know, it reminds me when I was a kid growing up. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. When I was a young kid in our church, everybody prayed in King James. Anybody else have that experience? That's a long time ago. But that, everybody prayed in King James. I mean, you had to do the these and the thous and the yeas and, you know, throw them in there pretty regularly. Otherwise, God couldn't hear it. I don't know if he couldn't understand Anything but uh, old English or what? But See, that's where the that sarcasm comes from. I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. Okay. This is humbling. But anyway, empty words. So true believers do whatever they do in humility. They're not there to be noticed. They're not like the Pharisees that are out on the street corner. They're blowing their trumpets. Hey, I'm going to pray now. We're going to have a prayer meeting right here on the, on the street corner so everybody can see. Yeah, I don't know. I've, I've run into this a, a few times in ministry, quite often in ministry. And, you know, I, I really try to avoid not being disingenuous about things. You know, like like being very, like using a lot of spiritual words in certain situations. I don't know if you can understand what I mean by that, but it, it just, like our, our lives, we need to be humble. We need to be who we are. We need to be real with people. We need to talk real with them. We need to cry with them, right? We don't need to take on a, a brave front just to show how spiritual we are that we're just trusting God in this situation. It's important, imperative for us to be real, to be sincere. It's easy for us to, to use Christianese in certain circumstances, but sincerity dictates that I would just be real. And we need to be mindful of the implications. The implications of what Christ has done for us and comparing it to empty words and just throwing it out there without, without it being from your heart. It needs to be genuine. Now, the other thing that I mentioned was dead works. And really what that comes down to is, what are we trusting in? This has been Jesus' message from the beginning of the Beatitudes all the way through the Sermon on the Mount. As he shares these things, what he wants, not in the things that we do. The Pharisees and the scribes, they trust in the things they do and whether they do everything right and, what, and whether they're perfect people, and whether they appear right to everyone else. But we need to understand that that is not the foundation of our salvation. The foundation of our salvation is Christ alone. So the true believers, what are the true believers all about? Well, in verse 24 through 27, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So here, I guess, is the summary of it. Jesus is summarizing all of these things that he's been teaching, all of this, this uh, message of going through the narrow gate rather than the wide gate. It all kind of depends on this foundation of who Christ is. Works... And what I mean by that is religious works is a weak foundation. There's a number of reasons why. I mean, it reminds me, first of all, the parable 
In Matthew 13, the parable of the sower and the seeds, some fell on the rocky places, just the opposite, right? But here's one of the reasons works as a weak foundation, because when the sun comes up and it beats down on the plant that has just sprung from the rocky place, it has no root, and it withers away. And the reason it withers away is because it's based upon yourself. That's the reason that the foundation erodes underneath you whenever hard times come. Whenever difficulty comes your way, whenever you're confronted with scary things, difficult things, terrible circumstances, eventually circumstances will wither you away because you know that your whole basis, the whole premise of what you are doing in a relationship with God is based upon how good you are. And here's the thing. You can lie to everybody else, but you can't lie to yourself. Deep down you know what you struggle with. Deep down you know what your weaknesses are. And ultimately, you know that none of that makes up. None of that makes up and gets you into heaven. None of it's good enough to do it. And you know, eventually the wolves will get you. Eventually, that weakness is going to show. Eventually, somebody's going to tell you, no, you should be doing it this way. And you'll give in to it. Because you don't realize the foundation isn't that, it's Christ. Christ alone is a true foundation. We're free. That's the crazy thing. We're free. We're free from working to pay a debt. Is that crazy? I mean, when I say it, it, it makes, I was going to say it makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck, but I mean, I haven't had any hair from there to there for it may be on the back of my back. Oh, that was too much. It's too much. Sorry. But, but we're free from working to pay off that debt. If you've ever been in that situation where you're trying to be a good enough person to please God, to make God happy, or at least make you think that you're making God happy, if you've ever been there, you know how much of a burden that is. It's like, oh, it's just too difficult. I can't keep it up. I can't. I mean, and then you just start putting up the facade and not worrying about the rest of it anymore. But you're free from that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You need to trust in him. And some are like, well, wait a minute. I mean, it's not willy-nilly here. We're not just, you know, just throwing everything out. Like, there has to be a certain way that we act and, and certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong, and absolutely you're right. But the only way you'll ever know is if you know the love of Christ and the example of Christ. And the only way that you'll have the strength to do it is if you know his love. I mean, really know his love. The kind of love that takes away that debt, the kind of life, love that, that takes away the guilt of your past. How many of us are disappointed by things that we have done in our lives? All of us, right? We've all been there. We've all faced that. You don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> but we know that's true. And the fact is, Jesus says, I forgive you. And that should be good enough for us. It's usually not, but it should be. And in fact, if you're struggling in your faith, that could be the reason why. Because you won't let God love you that way. When we trust him, this is what happens. When we trust him, we get a sense of how much he loves us. When we yield ourselves to him, then we know how much he loves us. And we're humbled because what we've received is absolutely undeserved favor. And that's what's wrong. That's what's wrong with us when we keep wrestling and fighting with different things in our lives. 
that we, we just feel like uh, either I shouldn't be fighting with it, I shouldn't be wrestling with it anymore, or maybe we have given up on wrestling with it and we've just accepted it. And we know it's wrong. We know that's wrong. But the problem is we don't trust him enough to know that he replaces it all. That he can overcome it. That if I will let him love me and I will love him un, uh, with all that I have and know that he loves me unconditionally, then I can overcome. I can overcome those things that I feel like I can't. The things that I can't let go. Because I'll find that he's sufficient for whatever it is that I'm not willing to let go of. And what I'm afraid, if it's not a part of my life anymore, I can't live without it. And when we grasp who he truly is, what he has truly done, this is what's going to happen. We're going to strive to please him. Like the more we understand that, the more we press into that, the more we will want to please him. The most powerful motivation for obedience is unconditional love. And the only one that can do it, the only one that can do it, is God. Now, it took many years to wrangle me as a husband. Many years. Like in the beginning, I was my own person, doing my own thing. My idea of marriage was, hey, you come on and join this because we're going doing this and that's my life, but you can jump in if you want. And nothing taught me, nothing broke that down, that attitude down like the love of my wife. And changed me from being a man to being human. No, I'm just kidding. That's, that's a bad joke. Uh, but you know, you know what I mean, right? I mean, that's, that's what our world thinks, is that all men are, are terrible because of our attitudes. Some of these things are very valuable. But the truth is, the truth is, is that it shaped me and changed me. Now imagine somebody who's perfect at it, because she's not perfect at it. I just, I just want to tell you that. She's not perfect at unconditional love. Neither am I. But just imagine if somebody's perfect at that, how much it can change your life. If you'll yield yourself to him, to his teachings, to his truth. The more we understand how undeserving we are, the more our motivation to please him becomes and the more solid our foundation becomes. What is the rock that we are built on? The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is establishing his ministry, but most importantly, he's teaching principles of kingdom living that are going to enrich the lives of his followers. That's what's happening that's what he's done. And what enriches our lives? Making him the foundation. We start there. We start with a relationship with him that's unbreakable, that we're not willing to give up. And then he transforms our lives. He reveals truth to us, helps us to understand what God really desires for our lives. And you know, it's interesting because in there when it talks about those who falsely follow the false prophets, the problem is is that they don't do the will of God. That's ultimately what their, their problem is. They're not following the will of God. They're not applying the will of God to their lives. They're unwilling to yield themselves to him. And that's where our salvation begins. I mean, a lot of times people are like, oh, do I need to pray a prayer? Do I need to... You know, yeah, you need to pray to God. You need to repent. You need to do all those things to find Jesus Christ as your Savior. But most importantly, you need to trust. Not, not just believe that he existed, but you need to trust that he can do it all. He can be totally sufficient for anything that you're, any void you're trying to fill. He is sufficient for it. Let us never forget that.